Howdy, everybody. Welcome back. We've got a pretty awesome video planned for you. Scott's gonna do a lot of the explaining, the scientific parts of the video. I'm gonna be doing processing throughout the whole thing. This one is called bison versus beef. So if you look here, you're gonna see a couple bison and a, a few beef carcasses hanging in our cooler. We are going to, Scott is going to be doing a lot of the explaining throughout the video. Um, just the differences, the cuts, and then also the nutritionals and things like that. So without further ado, take it away, Scott. The great American bison, both the story of tragedy and comeback. Um, bison is now the official mammal of the United States, which is fantastic. This animal has been through quite a storied history. In fact, bison, and the reason why there's such a great comeback story, were nearly slaughtered to extinction around the late 1800s. Um, estimates were as high as 50 to 60 million bison once roamed the Great Plains of the United States, and they were reduced to under 500 total, uh, total in the wild and in private herds around 1890. Um, it took a great conservative effort to bring them back to where we're at today. We have about 500,000 bison in the world today compared to around a billion cattle. Now, bison and beef, or more accurately, bison and cattle. First, we'll talk a little bit about their similarities and then we'll talk about our differences. Both are in the bovine family. So they're really brothers in all sense. They have a lot of the same genetic makeup. And um, cattle have been domesticated. Bison have not. Bison are completely unaltered from um, the way they were created. Also, bison are native to this continent, to the North American continent. Cattle are not. Bison were created and put here they're, um, they're specifically designed to take the most advantage out of our Great Plains um, in the sense of the, uh, the bison is a, a fantastic animal in its um, ability to survive uh, without uh, shelter, without veterinarian input. Um, they're truly undomesticated too. They're like the linebacker when it comes to the cattle family. When you look at one of these things, they just look awesome. Now there's a couple of subspecies in the bison family. Um, we're dealing with the plains bison. There's also the woods bison, which is found more, more up into Canada. And then there's the European uh, wisen that, um, that's actually been uh, removed from the wild or otherwise they're only in captivity and they've got some reintroduced. I don't know much about them. I just know that we have one of the best protein sources that you could ever find. Now, the term buffalo is, um, it's a mis misnomer, it's, it's okay, but bison are not in the same category as the African buffalo or um, the Asian buffalo. They truly are their own category. In fact, the scientific name is bison, bison. You can't hardly mess that one up. So today we're gonna to be talking about the difference um, with the, uh, the carcass, the, the makeup of the carcass, the look of it. Bison are much leaner. Um, they have a higher protein content. They're lower in cholesterol and they're lower in fat. And that makes them a great, healthy choice. They are absolutely the best protein that you can find in the United States. And that's really, really where we got our start. And that's where the white feather name comes from. Um, we've got another video planned on some of the history and how white feather um, it became our business name. But it really had to do with our start that came in the late uh, 80s when our uh, father got into raising the American bison. Um, so. We, uh, we're gonna talk about these, Seth's gonna break them down. Now, one of the most interesting things about the bison is that it has 14 total ribs. 
whereas the the beef or the cattle have just 13. So Seth's broken it down here between the fifth and sixth rib, and then he's up here between the 13th and 14th rib. If you look at this carcass here, it is gonna be a lot different in beef in just the sense you see a lot less fat covering the carcass. And then we've got this, this hump, this traditional hump that we have with the bison. You may have heard of a hump roast. There's not a lot there. It's actually pretty thin, mostly bone. That's where they store extra calories, and that's why it's got the most fat right here on this hump. But it is much wider than beef. If you look at, at these feather bones right here, Look at those feather bones, say, versus these feather bones on this beef. Now this is an Angus beef, and this is, um, and that's another thing with cattle. They've been diversified through selective breeding into uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of different versions, if you will. With American bison, we have just one undiversified, undomesticated version. So there's a good look at that carcass and some of the differences that we have there. Bison are also historically known to be much better at using the resources around them. In the wild, you'll find that the, the, the cattle mostly spend uh, their, their days looking for shade around water. They drink quite frequently. They use more resources with feed. With bison, they can go, um, it, it, they've been observed in the wild It really only go to a water source once a day and they um, they just make much better uses of their their resources like their feed and water resources so you can take a peek at this uh, primal right here and you can see there's not a lot of marbling in it and there's very minimal fat cover but believe it or not even without that marbling in there bison is very very tender and very flavorful. So now that the bison's broke down, let's head to the beef. So with beef, we've found, um, or what we're gonna see here is, is literally thousands of years of domestication um, and, and basically selective breeding to get exactly what we want out of it. So that's where you see a difference there in the ribeye of the beef versus the bison. So like Scott mentioned, this is an Angus sear. Um, not a ton of marbling in this, but you can see there's a, a lot larger ribeye section here. Um, you know, there again, not a ton of external back fat, but you're gonna be able to see the difference between the beef and the bison. Um, the, the bison is a much darker red. This has a little bit more of a, a palish look to it. And um, you can tell that the bison's gonna be a lot richer, a lot higher in iron, and that, that comes through when you see that, um, the color difference in the meat. Something that we're gonna do in this video is after we get these processed, we have a really cool cooking utensil that we're gonna use. Um, some of you have probably never heard of it before. It's called a birch barrel. So we're gonna get it out, we're gonna fill it with some charcoal, maybe a couple pieces of firewood, and we're actually going to grill a couple of these, um, and I think we're gonna do porterhouse steaks. So maybe like an inch and a half, two inch thick porterhouse steak off the bison and off the beef. We're gonna get them all grilled up and we're gonna give them a taste test. That's right, stick with us. We're gonna take these out on the floor. We're gonna walk you through some of the processing, a little bit of the different processing style that we have, bison versus beef. But ultimately we're gonna talk about the, the sweet, um, the bison actually have a sweet odor about them when you're out in the pasture, you can smell them. But the sweet taste of the bison versus the buttery flavor of the beef, we're gonna compare the two. We're gonna talk a little bit more about the nutritionals. So stick with us as we take these through the processing floor. And then ultimately, like Seth said, we've chosen a more of a primitive uh, style of cooking. And I'm pretty sure that it's gonna be worth sticking around for. This is gonna be a fun video. Let's get these out on the floor. Let me get one, bro. Oh, yeah. 
We're on the processing floor. Bison versus beef. Let's go. Got the Victorinox ready to go. Get them out here on the floor. And let's just get started processing. Front quarter of bison. Front quarter of beef. This isn't really going to be a competition between the two because being raised on bison meat, we think we, uh, which one would probably win. So this is going to be more about a, com a comparison between the two. We're going to run these simultaneously. So we're going to do the front quarter. We're going to cut it into all the primals, cut it into steaks on the bison, repeat the process on the beef. So let's just go ahead and get started. We're not going to be explaining um, as much of the how-to process since you folks have probably seen some of our other videos where we do more of the how-to. This is going to be just more about the breakdown, the cutout, and the side-by-side -side comparison of the two. We think it'll be fun, so stay tuned. We're gonna be pulling things like the skirt steak, the ribeyes. We're gonna be pulling flat irons, Denver's, chuck rolls. Um, on the front quarter and then on the hind quarter, we're gonna be cutting um, porterhouse and T-bones, the bone-in version, because like we mentioned earlier, we wanna get those big two-inch thick cut porterhouse steaks to throw on that birch barrel here this afternoon. So that's the plan. So like I was mentioning yesterday, bison, um, a sweeter meat, some would say drier, we do, think that bison has a uh, naturally high moisture content it just gets cooked out and that's why we um, will show you later this afternoon but you want to be cautious and err on the side of caution when cooking bison short ribs I'll peel the membrane off of these. Can't tell me those wouldn't be good on the smoker. Bison brisket. Running this through the saw, you can just tell that the uh, bones, bones are super soft, meats super tender. I'm gonna take this portion over to Scott that contains the uh, flat irons, the Denver, and the chuck eye. So Scott's going to fabricate this out for us. So like we pointed out in the cooler of the chuck, really the big difference is this part up here. And I'm going to show you when I break this down. I talked about energy storage or fat storage that the bison has. And they store that up there in their chuck, in that hump, if you will. You might have heard that, you know, hump roast and... The mountain men and whatnot ate the hump, and I'm certain that they did because of the amount of fat that's contained in there. You may be wondering why exactly if bison were nearly extinct at one time, are we slaughtering them? And it's truly one of the best ways to 
sort of save a species or whatever, if you think in terms of the bison now, it wasn't until they began, uh, you know, the con conservation efforts that bison were saved from the brink of extinction. And then it became, you know, it was, it was, the numbers grew, but they really weren't where they were now. Um, I think bison have pretty much doubled in the last two or three decades. So when our parents started raising bison in the early 90s, I think the national herd size was somewhere around 200,000, and now it's at 500. And you can attribute quite a bit of that to the commercial activity or otherwise the, the raising and harvest of bison for, for food. And it's become a, an excellent protein source and it's favored by many. In the, in the beginning, in the early 90s, bison was lauded as a low fat, lower in cholesterol, higher in protein meat. And it certainly still is now. Saturated fat, as we've learned, is not as detrimental to your heart health as once thought. So we're not as concerned about the low fat quality, but it's always nice to have a resource where you have lower fat, lower cholesterol, higher protein, as well as higher, higher vitamin and mineral content while it's an extremely tasty red meat. So you can, Seth talked about it like this, you can just tell the, the tenderness and the, the bison, like we said, they actually have a, a sweet odor to them. My Victorinox is, I, I think I've had this one for, well over a year, you can see I've used it on the stone quite a bit. It's maintained a real nice edge for me. There's a shoulder blade. Now, bison was essentially the economy of the Native American, the Plains Indian. They used the bison for 100% of their staple diet and all number of resources, including things that they made, their shelter. So we know that this animal has not just the resource of the meat, but also the hide and the hooves and the bones and everything else that came along with it. Because of the, the length of these, these feather bones here that I talked about, it actually makes it kind of difficult on the slaughter floor to uh, get our splitting saw through there. So now that I pull this chuck out, it's literally almost twice as long. This would be the hump right here. It's almost as twice as long as a beef. And I'm going to take we make a nice chuck roast out of the chuck eye, so I'm going to take my knife and be cutting right, right through this yellow cord. It's a pretty tough piece right here, this, this tendon. Now everything that we don't save for human consumption is getting saved for bones, for bone broth or for pet food. We don't let any part of this go to waste. This yellow cord's going to continue right up through here, but I want to show you, I'm actually going to... If we were to look for a hump roast, this would be it. This is literally the top of the hump, which on the adult males can be as, they can be as tall as six and a half feet. But I wanted to show you, see that's where a lot of that fat storage is. And that's why the mountain men would have, that's why they would have eaten this piece right here. Um, very rich, if you, 
you eat a bunch of that, um, you're going to get a lot of, a lot of fat, energy from the fat. So the rest of this is pretty, pretty similar to the beef. We've got that nice squared up chuck that we're going to cut into roast. And then this, this muscle on the, the bison, the, where we get the, the under, or excuse me, the Denver is somewhat thinner, but we've noticed that bison will actually swell up when it's cooking. And some of these thinner cuts will wind up coming out almost twice as thick as when, as when you started. Denver, our chuck, and of course, our flat iron. Time to pass this off to Seth and he'll finish it up. Bison brisket. Let's get this trimmed out. You're going to notice right off the bat that it is much, much smaller than beef. Even though these, these uh, sides weighed very similar beef and bison, some of the cuts on the bison are naturally just going to be smaller. A um, little bit bigger bone, bigger framed animal, slightly smaller cuts on them. So you're going to notice that right off the bat. Uh, you know, big packer brisket, grain fed, you're probably looking at 15 to 20 pound brisket. Bison, you know, you're probably looking at five and a half pounds, maybe. We've uh, smoked these, they're fantastic. Pair them with uh, some hickory wood chunks, season this with some bearded butcher black seasoning, get that nice crust going. Throw that on the smoker. Yum. Bison flat iron. Scott has this trimmed out really nice for me. So I'm just going to go ahead and remove this gristle seam out of the middle. There's one piece. Using that fish fillet method that we talked about. Now, one thing that we notice when we cut bison is the meat's a lot drier. It's leaner and it's drier. So when you're processing, things seem to uh, sort of stick to the blade a little bit more than you would on cutting a domestic you know, beef or something like that. And the uh, tables and things like that, just they just dry out more throughout the process. Cut that into three. Bison flat irons, bison chuck roll. A couple different ways you can do this. You can slice this into steaks and then you have chuck eye steaks. What we like to do with these is cut them into a two to three pound roast and make a boneless chuck roast. Our customers love these. They uh, will throw these in a netter. You can slow roast this entire roast and eat the, the entire thing. There's no gristle, minimal fat. Literally cook it and it'll just fall apart and eat the whole thing. Run these through our netter. This holds the meat together really nice when you're cooking it. Makes for a nice presentation in the meat case. Customers really, really like the way these roasts look with the netting on them. And it's useful too, it doesn't just look good. 
boneless spice and chuck roast. Cold winter day, Dutch oven or crock pot, throw your favorite, favorite vegetables in there, cook them till they fall apart tender. Makes for an awesome meal. One of the prime possessions on any animal, the rib section. We're going to trim this down and cut ribeye steaks today. So the first thing we do is remove the membrane off the bones. And you've seen this process before on some of the other videos that we've done. Like Scott mentioned, the bones, those are not going to waste. Those will be used for bison bone broth. Making those cuts and using that pressure with your right hand just to separate that seam. Remove the patty whack. Now I'm gonna take these bones off of here. We're gonna save these as bison back ribs, sort of like a baby back rib on pork. You can do this with beef, bison, elk, whatever species. That way somebody can come into the shop and they can buy those back ribs and they can toss those on the smoker. Do a little bit of trimming. I always trim my primals prior to slicing into steaks. That way they're nice and uniform. You don't have to go back through and trim each individual steak. They're already trimmed, ready to go. Now I can just go down through there and cut them into steaks. Now that I've got it all trimmed down, what I want to do is I want to wait to cut this into steaks until I do the beef. That way I can have the beef um, ribeye section sitting side by side to the bison, and then we'll get each one cut into steaks and we'll do our comparison. So for the time being, I'm gonna set that one aside and we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna get started on the beef. You can see that the cuts that we have on our table already are from the bison, from the bison front quarter. We're gonna go ahead and do the same thing on the beef front quarter. And like I mentioned, then we will go to the hinds. We'll get everything paired out on the table, bison versus beef. Let's get started on the beef. Skirt steaks. If you guys have never had beef skirt steaks or bison skirt steaks, get a hold of some. Fibers are running this way. You can see between the muscle fibers, there's a decent amount of fat. Super tender, super flavor, flavorful. Just a delicious cut. Fun to grill. You can grill it, cut it into like steaks. You can make fajitas with it. Really, really good cut. It's a, this is an inside diaphragm muscle. Doesn't get a lot of use. Kind of a little bit underrated steak that a lot of people don't know about. Uh, recently had a good friend of ours tell us that it's his second most favorite steak on a beef carcass. I should mention that he did say his favorite steak is a ribeye, so.
here again. Chuck Eye, Flat Iron, Denver. I'm gonna pass this off to Scott. He's gonna do what he does best. Here's that beef chuck. Like I mentioned, it's just more or less flat across the back. Really no hump. And I'll show you once I get down to those feather bones how much different it is. So I have to mention being drier, you can definitely see more of a fat cap here. Like Seth mentioned, even though this beef side weighed on the rail just a little bit more than the bison, you can see the, really the, the biggest differences are in the front quarters between the two. You can see just how dramatically different those feather bones are. And then if I cut this one the same way, down through that yellow cord to get that squared up chuck rose. There's that same piece. Quite a bit different anatomically here. Probably the biggest difference comes right from this front, right from this front chuck area between the two. So I also have the bison brisket laying here and you'll be able to see the biggest difference in the size comparison between the two when they're side by side like this. Now this half of beef weighed around 350 pounds hanging weight on the rail. So you could imagine if this was a big, you know, 500 pound half, how much larger it would be even than what it is here. So you can see the difference between the, the briskets. It's pretty significant. Even though the carcasses on the rail were very similar in weight, how much different in size some of these cuts are. Second most tender steak on an animal is the flat irons, that top blade steak. Sees very little, if I don't know, maybe next to no use on the carcass because of where it's located in the top of that shoulder blade. It just doesn't see any movement, so that's why it's so tender. A little bit of marbling in there. Delicious. Throw those on the grill. Ten inch Victorinox. So I have just touch on it real briefly here. 10 inch, eight inch, six inch bony knife. You all know about that one. Um, that's kind of the arsenal for processing. Some of the larger cuts, get your 10 inch out. Just makes it easier making your way down through there with minimal sawing back and forth. So these are the chuck eye roasts here again. Very little fat, no gristle, no bone. You can throw bones in the pot with it if you want more flavor. Get those netted up. Perfect for a roast meal. On to the beef ribeye steaks. We're gonna do the same thing like we did the bison. We're gonna save the back rib. Somebody will have a good time barbecuing those up. Let's remove our bones. Those out of the way. So over the years you learn different tricks and things like that. So like when I remove this patty whack here, you can pretty much just hold your knife and then pull it and you can see it's it's cutting at the same time so i don't want to make a cut here because then i'll cut down into the, the ribeye steak so if i just hold my knife here and pull it a little trick for you 
go ahead and remove the bones. Staying as close to the bone as we can. Now, as mentioned in some of our other videos, if I left this bone on these stakes, on these sections here, if I left it on there, that would be called a rib stake. I remove the bone, that's now a rib eye. If I leave the bone on it, cut it into a roast, that's a prime rib. If I take the bone off, cut it into a roast, that's simply a ribeye roast. So there's the beef. Let's get the bison, get them side by side, and get them cut. Ribeye sections. I bet you guys can guess which is which. Beef, bison. You can see Scott talked a lot about that, that hump on that bison, and you can see that being revealed here through this ribeye section. A little bit more narrow on this end. Color-wise, the bison's definitely a lot darker red, a little bit, you know, a lot richer color. The beef has more of a white fat and more of that cherry red look. So let's just go ahead and get these cut into steaks. See what they look like. A nice inch and a quarter. I can tell when I'm cutting through here that very tender cut. Doesn't take a lot of pressure on my knife to get through it. Some nice fat in those. Those will be a very, very good steak. You guys hear us talk about the butcher's take. Whenever we're cutting these primals like this, we end up with these little pieces that aren't cut evenly. So that's usually what we take home and grill ourselves. We own these animals. We raise the bison. We'll go into that uh, more in detail here after a little while. We buy the beef from local farmers. So when it comes to saving anything off of these that we wanna cook and eat ourselves, we can certainly do that because we own the animals. Now, if you were having a beef custom process and your butcher told you that, you'd probably be a little bit worried because certainly shouldn't be taking any of it if it belongs to you. Okay. So let's just get these laid out here. I want to count them. They're cut about the exact same thickness. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So I would have guessed that it looked like there was more beef here than there, than there are bison, but it's because of their size and it fills up more of the table. If we grab a couple of these nice center ones here with that nice ribeye cap on there, we do our comparison. The bison, you can see, is a thinner cut. Fat content is very similar. As mentioned, we picked a beef carcass that was similar in size, just to make the comparison a little bit easier, you know, easy to see. If this was a bigger carcass, obviously this ribeye primal would probably be twice that size on the beef. So darker red on the bison, a little bit paler cherry color on the beef. Oh, get them in the right place. That is your side-by-side -side comparison bison versus beef on the ribeye steaks. It's time to tackle the hindquarters. Bison, beef. You can see the bison's a little bit wider. The beef is gonna be more round and a lot thicker. Put those two side by side. And you can also notice the color difference. More of a white fat on the beef, more of a yellow on the bison. So we're going to pull flank steaks, we're going to pull tri-tips, and we're going to cut the bone inversion, which I mentioned earlier, porterhouse and T-bone. If I made those steaks boneless, we would have filet and strip. We'll cut the sirloins out of these, and we'll just work our way through and continue with our comparison. First off, pulling those flanks. 
That's the flank steak on the bison. Pull this rose meat off of here first. This just goes into trimmings for burger. Now, we're not mixing the trim on the beef and bison throughout this process. Sean and Scott are keeping each species separate as we go. Let's go ahead and pull this bison flank out first. one of his buddies in the pen must have got him with a horn a little bit there but we'll just remove that portion discard it and what we're left with will be just fine that did make it a little bit smaller than it should be you can see when I pull these those muscle fibers run down this way one of our favorite dishes with a flank steak, and we have a video on this, is where we actually take it and we butterfly it, and then we stuff it. You can stuff it with your favorite fillings. That was my New Year's Eve dinner. Scott did have that for New Year's Eve. It was delicious too, wasn't it? It was, one of our standbys. So, beef flank. There's the beef versus bison. Obviously, I had to take a little bit off that end because of that bruising. But you can see color, size. Throughout this whole comparison, that's going to be the biggest difference. And then, of course, when we get to the end, we'll do the taste. Tri-tips. Another one of our favorite cuts. We start by pulling these knuckles out. This is where you get your sirloin tip. Round tip rows, some places it's called. You have to be careful when you pull these out of here or you'll cut right through that, that tri-tip. You gotta find that seam, work that seam out of there without hacking into it. Where it's located, it kinda be a little bit tricky to get out of there. So, get that pulled out. Steam it out, and I will show you where the tri-tip's located. Delicious cut to throw in the smoker. And there again, we have a video explaining where it comes from and how we cook it. Get it trimmed up a little bit. We like to try to get this gristle off of here. That way after it's cooked, when you slice it, you're not slicing through that gristle and trying to eat that. Bison tri-tip. I'm just gonna continue on this bison hindquarter and then we will get all these Cuts pulled out and then we'll get started on the beef. Bison kidney suet. We save this. A lot of times what we do with it is we mix it in with our venison ground meat. Make some really good venison hamburgers. Now I'm just going to separate the round portion from the sirloin. Grab my hand saw. story goes that in the olden days, butchers would get paid 
by that piece right there. And however many of those they produce in a day is how they got paid. So you know you've got your, you made your cut right. It's called the butcher's dollar. The butcher's dollar. So it should be about the, about the shape of a dollar coin. Interesting fact for you. Bison round tip. Cut this into some roast. Nice two to three pounder. This is one of my favorites. Season it up. I'd probably use, typically what I do is I use our original bearded butcher blend seasoning and then we crock pot it or Dutch oven until it falls apart and then we throw our barbecue sauce in it and make pulled barbecued sandwiches. Can't beat it. I'm going to break down this, uh, the short loin here. I'm gonna pull the sirloin off of it and then I'm gonna cut the porterhouse and T-bone and then I'm going to take the round portion and hand it over to Scott and he's gonna fabricate that like he does the front portion of the chuck on the animal. So Scott is gonna get this as soon as I'm done with it. Let me remove the, remove the shank. Get that out of the way. Remove the H bone. Talked about it before, but this is why it's important to wear chain mail when you're breaking carcasses like this. If your knife's gonna slip, this is where it's gonna happen. And if it did slip, boom, it's gonna stab me and that wouldn't be good. So that's why I'm wearing the chain mail. Trim this outer portion off. This gets darkened up a little bit through the dry aging process in the cooler. Off to Scott. The rounds on bison and beef really aren't a whole lot different. First, we start by pulling this massive femur bone out of here. And then we break this down into top round, bottom round, eye of round. The one thing that is a larger muscle on these bison is the eye of round. We'll get to that in a second. Now it should be noted, Seth will do things a little bit differently because his role is purely that of a fabricator. In other words, he just produces the cuts. I have two roles because while I'll fabricate and prep cuts for further processing by him or further presentation, I also share the responsibility with Sean of the trim pieces. So a lot of times when I'm fabricating, I trim along the way and when Seth's fabricating, he leaves that up to just the, he has the ability to toss it over onto our table. But sometimes I work ahead of myself a little bit because I know it'll just wind up either being me or Sean doing it anyway. And what we're going to do with these rounds is we're going to, there's a seam right here that I'm working alongside. We're going to separate them and cut jerky and roast out of these. So I think it's commend commendable, something that you were into this for a little over an hour now, Seth, Sean and I. Now with the bison, it was raised right here on our farm. Um, and I think it's just, it's commendable and, and maybe a little bit remarkable that we with the, the three guys that we have here on our floor in just a little over an hour's time, we're going to take animals that we slaughtered, which is, an, again, such an important step in the process of converting animals to food is the slaughter step. I think it's often overlooked. But you have three men here that are not only capable, but... Um, I guess, well-versed in the conversion of animals to 
packaged products and we're able to do it all with just the same three people, our industry has become much, much more consolidated over the years. And while you have guys that can do the slaughter step, they can't do the processing step and, and take it all the way to further packaging as well. And we can do that not only one species, but we have the ability to do just about six or seven different species here we do beef, pork, lamb, kind of your more common domesticated animals. We do bison, which is really interesting. Bison considered an exotic. It's classified as the, with the USDA as an exotic, which is backwards in my opinion because it's the only one of those species that's native to this continent. But anyway, Bison being the fourth, and then also we do elk, we do venison, we do goat, we do, um, we have done ostrich, which if we can get our hands on an ostrich, we'll show you that process from slaughter down through processing as well. But I just think it's remarkable to have three guys that have the ability to turn out these products in a short period of time. So you were talking about doing what we're doing from slaughter to here, but it, you also have to enter in the fact that you're not only raising the animal, you're also raising the food to feed the animal. That's right. So it starts way back and goes through the whole process. Pretty closed loop system. That's Sean's responsibility. He's been raising these bison for 30 plus years now and uh, it's kind of cool that it all comes from one spot and it's all done by the same people and that we have the knowledge and the ability to do it and to turn animals into not just food but highly palatable marketable food. My first step is going to be breaking the sirloin off of here so remove that sirloin portion then I can get started cutting my porterhouse and T-bone. Square it up. First thing I'm gonna do is pull that chunk of filet out of there. So I'm gonna take one porterhouse off of here. Like so. Now I'm gonna go ahead and cut a two inch porterhouse. And that baby is what we're gonna put on the birch barrel and cook. There are less porterhouse steaks on bison than there are on beef. So as you can get down here towards this end, you can see that tenderloin quickly disappears when you're cutting that bison short loin. And there you have bison porterhouse and bison T-bones. Working on the sirloin, I removed a chunk of tenderloin out of there. This is where the picanha comes from, probably seen in some of our other videos. So go ahead and get it trimmed up, get it squared up. We're not going to save that picanha today as a separate steak. We're going to leave it on our sirloins as we as we cut our sirloin steaks. So let's get this knuckle pulled out of here. We'll trim out that beef tri-tip. Just like we did on the bison. Finding those seams. Just pulling it out like so.
starting to run out of room on my table. Which we knew it was going to be an issue how we were going to fit an entire half of beef and an entire half of bison on our tables. But they're going to be full, but we'll manage. We, wanted, we definitely wanted to get everything cut and everything laid out for that visual, that good side-by-side -side comparison visual that we wanted to do. So some people may not trim these up as much as this. It's certainly a personal preference. Our customers in our store like them to come pre-trimmed like this, so we go ahead and do that for them. Just like that. Beef round tip, two to three pound roast. If you don't save these as a roast, this makes fantastic stir fry, stew meat, etc. So just keep that in mind. If you want to go to the store and buy a roast to make your own stew meat, stir fry at home, grab a round tip. Maybe labeled sirloin tip some places, but it's a great roast. Move the kidneys to it. Here again, we save it. We have soap makers that come in and buy it. We have people that like to feed their birds, etc. There's that butcher's dollar we talked about. There's the beef, sirloin, porterhouse, and T-bone. We'll set this over here on the saw. We're gonna do the same thing with the beef round that we did the bison. I'm gonna go ahead and get it slightly broke down and Scott's gonna do the rest. Moving that hind shank. Move the H bone. And Scott will pull the top round, the eye of round, and bottom round out of this for me. Typically, we're cutting London broils, save an eye around roasts, and making jerky. Remove that sirloin. Same thing as the bison. Let's go ahead and remove uh, one steak. Take her up to two inches. Look at that dandy. Cutting the rest of them about an inch and a quarter. So there's the porterhouse, that starts the T-bone. Just remember folks, the difference between the two, porterhouse, T-bone. Let me scrape them up a little bit here so you can see them better. Porterhouse steak is gonna have that portion of the filet in there. The T-bone is gonna have a very little portion of that filet in there. Just remember, that's the difference between a porterhouse 
at a T-bone steak. You get down here to the end of this loin and there's virtually no piece of that tenderloin in there at all. I mentioned the eye around, the bison eye around noticeably bigger than the beef. So Scott, yeah. it's like Scott's bicep, Seth's bicep. Listen to him. Let's see him. <laughs> I got a long sleeve shirt That's what on, buddy. 25 years of skin and cattle will do. We're rounding third and heading home on this uh, beef versus bison. I still, uh, I have these sirloins to cut, so let's go ahead and do that. Bison sirloin. We typically cut these, these uh, first one or two sirloins, um, we typically cut them in half, just because they end up being pretty large if we don't. And if you notice here, I'm sort of getting crammed on my table. So we're definitely running out of space, but this video is gonna be a fantastic one because I was able to get the whole half of bison, the whole half of beef cut, and then we're gonna go through and do the uh, detailed explanation of what we ended up with. But it's been a little bit of a challenge fitting everything on my table. But we'll work through it and it'll be just fine using my 10 inch Torinox breaking knife. Works out really well on these. Go down through it with one easy pass. Shoop. Just like that. So you can see the comparison here side by side. Beef versus bison with a sirloin. Much, much darker red there again on the sirloins compared to the beef. Definitely more fat cover on the beef. Similar amount of cuts. Looks like I got an extra small one on the beef versus the bison, but we got three big ones, three small ones, three small ones, three, four big ones. Whew, that was a little bit of a workout, but we got it done. Bison versus beef. It's all laid out on both of these two tables. We did have to utilize both tables to get this accomplished. Now it's time for the overview. Let's go through, I'm gonna show you the cuts. You can look at the comparison and we'll start with everything off of the front quarters and we'll move to this table, which is everything off the hind quarters. So starting over here, Scott wanted to save some little hump roast. So that's something It's gonna be did. our appetizer while we're cooking. So we're gonna cook those porterhouse steaks later and these are gonna be the appetizers. So we have some hump roast, flat irons, skirt steaks, some soup bones. Awesome buco. We have bison brisket, we have Denver, we have short ribs, back rib, stew meat, bison ribeyes. By far, one of my favorite cuts that we sell in the shop, period, is a bison ribeye. Delicious. Some arm roasts, some of those netted chuck roasts. Moving over to the beef, soup bones, skirt steaks, like I mentioned. Don't skip on a skirt steak. Next time you see one, buy one. They're phenomenal. Skirt steaks, back ribs, short ribs, arm roasts, beef ribeyes, some stew meat, beef brisket. We're gonna throw a side-by-side -side comparison with the little beef humps there too, little nuggets. Beef Denver, some flat irons, those netted chuck roasts. Now, Let's move to the back table. Let's go over the hindquarters. Hindquarters, bison, beef. I've got a little bit co-mingled here, but I'm gonna go through and separate, show you what's what. Bison, top round, bottom round, beef, same thing. Eye of round, bison, beef, Seth versus Scott. <laughs> Tri-tips, bison, beef, flank steaks, Bison beef. We have some fillets. These are all beef fillets. Same amount, these are bison. Dandy, dandy steaks. We have some sirloins. Bison sirloins, beef sirloins. Sirloin tips, round tips. Those are bison, these are beef. And then we have our bone-in steaks. Don't forget, if we made these boneless, 
They would be filet and strip, but we left the bone in, so we have porterhouse and T-bone. These are beef, these are bison. Now let me go ahead and pull out that steak that we're gonna cook. We're gonna take these two side by side, bison versus beef, beef, bison. We're gonna get them on the birch barrel, we're gonna cook them, and we're gonna eat them. And I can't forget, that fun little story I told you about the butcher's dollar. And I've got two bucks. I'm worth two dollars today. So there it is. That's the breakdown. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that portion of the video. Stick around. Scott and I are going to go get the birch barrel uh, fired up. And if you've never heard of a birch barrel, it's a pretty cool uh, grill based out of Bozeman, Montana. Those guys are located next to uh, Cody, who we went elk hunting with out there in Bozeman. Um, really cool unit. It's a tripod grill, something you've probably never seen before. Let's go get it fired up. Let's eat some steak. Time to fire up the birch barrel. Now, <clears throat> you can burn charcoal, you can burn wood. Today we're gonna be using the Rockwood charcoal, um, something we really like. Now in here is the charcoal pan. This actually has different, nine different levels of the folding handle. So I'm just gonna leave it down where it's at right now. Throw in my charcoal. And we're gonna add some wood to this too, just for flavor. But our main cooking heat source rather is gonna be this charcoal. I don't know what it is, but as soon as you get some fire going, things just feel a whole lot warmer and friendlier. That's the great thing about the birch barrel is, um, is you can lift this up with a pistol grip and it takes away your cooking grate. And then you just simply lower your cooking grate down Unlock it, and you can lift this out of the way. And I can adjust my charcoal bed appropriately for my cooking. We'll let this charcoal get started, Seth's in the shop finishing up, and then it's time to cook and eat. Now that she's good and lit, I'm gonna add some hickory wood chunks so we get some nice wood flavor oh yeah with the pistol grip lifting and lowering system with the birch barrel you can lift your cooking grate away Add more charcoal, add wood chunks, do whatever you want to do. It's a simple twist of the lid. Cooking grate stays where, it, where it's at. You lift the lid up. And you can do this too if you have food on here and you find that your food needs to be taken away from the heat source for a minute or two. Stick it up here. Stick it down here. In fact, we're going to be doing some of that because we want to just do a slow, more or less a reverse sear. So we're gonna put our steaks on and we're just gonna keep, up, keep them up here in the lid while we make some coffee and drink some coffee and hang out, right Seth? It's time to get these bad boys opened up, get them on our block and get them seasoned. There's the beef. And out with the bison. that original beard of butcher blend seasoning going with the OG we talk about getting up off the surface like this a little bit higher distributes the seasoning a little bit better we're gonna go ahead and coat 
all sides of these stakes. There's so much surface here to cover. And we're not gonna really be able to over season these because they're so thick that there's gonna be a lot of parts of the inside that won't even, uh, obviously aren't even gonna be seasoned. So let's go like this, get it covered real nice. Perfect. You can see I used just just maybe not quite half of this six ounce shaker for these two big porterhouse steaks. Just remember, if you order the bucket online, shaker, you get this for free. And then we also just started offering the refill bag for the bucket. So in that order, grab the bucket, get the free shaker, order the refill bag, two year shelf life, you guys are gonna be good to go. Let's get these steaks on the grill. Let's get these bad boys on the grill. Beef and bison. So you can bet that we're gonna be taking our sweet old time with these so what I'm gonna do is, I'm actually gonna be really cautious with them just because of uh, the fact that we wanna go low and slow. So I went ahead and hooked up my uh, grill grate. My grill grate is now suspended with the lid, as you can see. And I'm just gonna put these over here. I'm gonna let them smoke, build all that nice flavor, warm up slowly. I mean, they're two plus inches thick, around two inches thick. And that's the great thing about the birch barrels, we can adjust our heat by just uh, moving this, this lid up and down. So now that those are on there doing their thing, I'm gonna brew some coffee. And um, I took my little hump roast and I cut it in real thin pieces. I'm gonna lift this up and I'm gonna throw those on the grate real quick and we'll have a little appetizer while these are smoking. We don't talk about our coffee often enough because it's something that Seth and I drink every single day and we have for what? How long have we been ever since drinking we were, our own coffee ever blend? Ever since we were stealing it out of Dad's thermos. And we were well, I know that, but I'm talking about our own blend. Oh, uh, seven years? Ours seven, is eight, a... Seven or eight years? It's a blend of Costa Rican, Guatemalan, and Ethiopian coffees. And a friend of ours roasts this for us and has been for a number of years. And it's how we start every single day. I wish you guys could smell it. You want a cup? Absolutely. So, coffee is available online. It gets great, great reviews from everyone that tastes it. So this is similar to the setup that we had out in Montana, the yep. pour over. The only difference is, is we don't have any mountains in the we background. Don't have mountains. I think the coffee tasted better in Montana. I think we should go back. I think so too. <laughs> cool. Cool, Good. Sure. If you like it. Ben, do you want a cup? It's time for my my hump steaks. If I had to guess, those might be a tad chewy. Oh, they will be. I've had them before. Tons of but flavor. But they make up for it in flavor. Yeah, there's going to be a bit chewy. I'm going to use them to clean up all that spice. How's that sound? Great plan. Uh, and of course it's snowing on us. That's all right. That's what the mountain men would have done. It's all about the experience. That's right. No seasoning left behind. We chose original just because it was the OG and that just felt right. with regard to buffalo. Want to beam me up there, Scotty? I'm gonna throw these. He's gonna just get a quick, he's gonna get a quick dash on the coals. See now, something I noticed right away that's pretty nifty with this birch barrel 
is that I can just lift this in the air where the steaks are cooking and you'd have access right to those coals. Pretty handy. You ever had a hump steak, Seth? I don't think I have. I actually have. I love caveman style cooking though, so I think I'll like it. You see better if I do that? I can't see. <laughs> I can't quite, see, Rob. I can't see. They're not quite ready. This one is. What the heck do we care, Seth? They're done. Yep. Even if they're partially raw, they're done. There's our appetizers. Those are going to cool for a minute. Then we're going to go to town. So, you know what I think I'm gonna do Scott while those are sitting there cooling a minute I'm gonna go ahead flip. I'm gonna go ahead and give these a, a flip Now, put that lid right back on there, twist it, get it up off the fire a little bit. Let's do the other side. Who wants some nice, rare hump steak? Look at that. That's, oh, so Tasty. Boys, was I wrong about it being chewy? Yeah. Maybe a wow. tiny bit. Mm. That's an appetizer I can get with. Hop right in there. there. Hop in there, boys. Mm. Wow. That's delicious. Grab some, Spencer. Don't mind if I do. You're really good. I just remembered I need to change with something. I mentioned the bison being um, a big part of our history, specifically the White Feather brand. And I was, I'm, I'm actually outside of a log cabin that my dad built. Well, we helped too. We were much younger then. Um, we have a real affinity for uh, log cabins. My grandfather uh, lived in the, there's like an apartment built on the side, but I was in there poking around and I found some really cool stuff. I'm gonna grab it and sit down here and show you. So my dad and my mom, they, um, they named the business White Feather because they started raising bison in 1986, 1987. I was like five or six years old then. But I was going through some of the stuff in my grandpa's cabin and I found these old newspaper clippings. This is from 1990. Seth and I here, the other kids. This is when it says that this herd may end up on the Browns training table. My dad was working with the Cleveland Browns getting bison into their train facility. There's an old brochure for the business. And the name White Feather came from the uh, symbol of peace that the Native American tribes gave to our, our ancestors. They put a white feather over their door. So when our parents started the bison business, they named it White Feather. Uh, white Feather Bison Company. That one's from 1993. Here's the meat shop right here, White Feather Meats, as it looked. Um, this is a business plan from back in the day. Our dad was actually one of the first ones Buffalo to Rome range in Creston while owner Rome's internet. He was one of the first ones to have uh, an online company in this area. Um, you think, you know, late 80s, early 90s, the internet was pretty new. These are really cool. There he is right there. That's right there in our shop. We still have that same picture window. Fred, own, Fred Perkins, owner of White Feather Meats, found his career in Buffalo. This whole basket is literally full, and this kind of expanded. It went from like the, the local news, Men's Journal, 1995. So you see, as the years go went on, he um, he started to get more and more recognition nationally, and it's really unique, and it's what we draw a lot of our. Um, A lot of our marketing prowess is from the vision that our dad had with bison meat. So I thought that was really cool. There's a little history on 
bison, they're really the cornerstone of our business because that's how our, our meat business started was with raising, selling bison meat and, um, and having them slaughtered um, right at the location that they're at now. Um, our dad bought the business in 1994. It was an established uh, slaughterhouse. And that's where Seth and I grew up. Uh, that's how we learned all these different species. But it really is the cornerstone was built on bison. So for you know well over 30 years, bison have been on this farm. And that's why Seth said we're a little bit biased, simply because we, uh, we love the animal just for what it means to us. We Thought can't even appreciate that. We can't even make this a competition because bison's automatically going to win in our book. So, but um, I wanted to bring a little bit of that yeah. in, and we do have um, we do have a, a feature plan where we're going to do. Um, we actually have our dad um, doing his, you know, his version of the history and how he started the company, and everything like that. Um, we've got that filmed. We're going to do some more with uh, the brothers and uh, get that out more of like a historical look at each one of us and how we got to where we are we are right now. So thought I wanted to interject that real quick and see what you guys thought. Time for another flip. There's the beef. Where we're at. And there's the bison. Low 90s. Low 90s on the beef. We'll keep a closer eye on the bison because it's going to cook up. See, it's it's already almost 15 degrees more. So we're going to keep a closer eye on that. We're almost ready for a a sear. Pull the bison aside. The beef too. You ready for a sear? Let's get them off. Time to get these bad boys off. Let them rest. And then back on the birch barrel we go. So what, what were we at, Scott? 110-ish? Yep. So now what we're going to do is we're going to move our coal basket. We're going to grab our coal basket. We're going to move it up as high as it'll go so that we get a real nice sear on these steaks. I'm going to go ahead and lower the lid. Let's go ahead and get this lid out of the way. And let's lift that basket up. baby all the way to the top. Put our lid back down. Now we have the coals right underneath that grate. Where we can do a real nice sear. So now that we've been resting for a few seconds, a few minutes here, it's like the beef is Registering 117 or so. Bison about the same, maybe just a couple of degrees. No, nope, about the same. Going back on. Listen to that sizzle. So I'm just gonna leave the lid in the air this time and we're gonna watch these real close. We'll sear them on one side, flip them, sear them on the other side. We're going to pull these probably no more than 135 degrees. And then we'll slice them and see what we've got. I think it's time for a flip. Wow. Look at that. He's just trying to outdo my hump steaks. Yeah. These are not going to take long. Going to have to keep a real close eye on these puppies. I'd rather eat them over than under. We have met temp. There's the bison. And there's the beef. 
crazy good looking. So we were upper 120s on pretty much both of them. We don't want to take them any further just for fear that they will be overcooked and that's certainly something we don't want to do. So, so I'm going to start with the beef first. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this fillet out like so. And then I'm going to move down along this bone here. And I'm going to cut the strip portion out like so. And then what I'm going to do is just start up here at the top. Working our way down. And we're going to put this steak back together in its original form. Look at that. Look how juicy. Look how juicy that is. Wow. There's one side. We weren't really planning on the snow, so the snow is adding a little bit of moisture to our table here, but hey, we'll get it done either way. And don't worry about that meat that's left on that bone. We'll gnaw that off of there too. So as you can see, that bison, that strip side is a lot narrower than the beef. In the tenderloin side, even though these came from the exact same place on the uh, short loin of those animals, the tenderloin is actually a little bit larger. This, I know, is going to be incredible. Ready for a sample, Scott? I cannot wait. So which one are you going to sample first, the beef or the bison? Um, I think I'm going to go with... Uh... I mean, I don't know why I wouldn't just go straight for the absolute best bite that I could get right here. I want I'll to split it with you. How's oh, that? Oh, I'm sound? getting my own piece. Thanks for the gesture, but oh my goodness! Hmm. <laughs> you get the sweetness almost immediately. Just. The texture is so soft that it's 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 like it's like red meat sushi. It's, you almost it's don't have to chew it. You could like use the roof of your mouth and your tongue and just squish it and eat it. It's the sweetness is what gets you right yeah. off the bat. Now, a lot of people think that bison is going to be gamey, not gamey at all. And like we mentioned earlier. We almost can't make this a competition because you know which one we're gonna choose. Scott just went through all the history stuff. We're gonna choose bison. The other thing too, they say that when you raise, like, have you ever heard that people, they start looking like their pets or their pets? Yeah. <laughs> we raise buffalo and it should be pointed out with the beard and like the bigger, the bigger shoulders. Starting to look maybe, like one. <laughs> maybe we look a little bit oh, like you're them. Going, you're going that route? Yeah, go I right am. To, right to the beef filet. Not as tender. It's fantastic. I would if you were get if you had ordered this at a restaurant, I would be thrilled. But the first thing I noticed, it doesn't have that sweetness. You know, and and um, it's it's excellent. It's fantastic. It's got more of that um, the the beef like not not butter but like beefy flavor yeah it's beefy but it's it does not have that sweetness now the other thing i noticed too these steaks were cut the exact same thickness and the bison even though we pulled these at the same temp it didn't cook through quite as much as the beef did and i think um and i mean you can see here it's it's pretty medium rare to rare on the inside of that steak so just interesting fact that the bison actually um Look like it cooked less, even though they're the same thickness and they were on for the same amount of time. 
Oh my goodness. The moisture too. We, really, really good. Really happy with the way that this uh, this turned out. I mean, the the just the reassurance that I knew that we would get, just knowing that we've been eating bison for over thirty years and just fantastic, if, phenomenal. If somebody cooked these side by side and didn't tell you, you would just think that the bison's really, really good beef. Um, but it wouldn't throw you off to the point where you're like, oh, I'm not eating bison because it's going to be, you know, like we mentioned, gamey or something like that. Not at all. I mean, serve, this could be served in a high-end restaurant all over the world um, with some of the top beef steaks you've ever eaten. Guaranteed. One of the best things I've ever eaten. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think my beard just grew a half an inch. So... You'll find the Bearded Butchers putting their stamp on bison every single time. We hope you enjoyed the video. We hope you enjoyed learning a little bit more about the native beef, the one that belongs on this continent. And we're so proud of the 30 years plus years that we've been around these animals. We're thankful that our, our dad was a visionary like he was and he started raising the bison because it's really led us to where we're at today. So we want to encourage you, if you have the opportunity, be the bison. The best way to ensure a long future for these animals, the great comeback story, is to support the commerce associated around the commercial activity that is the raising and the butchering and the consumption of this fantastic red meat. Absolutely. And you know, we've talked about this before where we don't have a big fancy Cook Island, you know, patio behind our house that we're that we're cooking this food on. Um, you know, we're on our farm. This is just how we do it. So we've got the pretty cool birch barrel that we use here today. You've seen us use the Traegers. You've seen us use the big green eggs. Um, but you know, we started this video this morning. We did uh, all the processing. We did all the packaging. We made a bunch of sticks, uh, smokies later this afternoon, and then we just came outside and we fired up the birch barrel and we cooked and ate some food. So nothing extremely fancy about our setting. However, this is real, this is us. That's what you're gonna get. So we hope you enjoyed the video. Once again, don't forget to follow us on all of our pages, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Can't forget TikTok now, um, but anyways, we hope you enjoyed the video. Um, thanks for following along. We are almost at 600,000 subscribers on our channel and over 51 million channel views. That's awesome. That's it all awesome. started with bison. Yep. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Appreciate it. Until next time, see ya.